I'm back with some Linux and open source tech news this week. We're going to be jumping into multiple kernels all living in one Linux system, Git trying to make Rust mandatory, a new file system that's being introduced to Linux, and much, much more. Let's get right into it with Turn File System, an exabyte scale multi-region distributed file system. This week we received a new open source file system, TurnFS has decided to open source their efforts and make their file system available as a free software on their public GitHub repo. And this announcement from XTX Markets, who's a huge algorithmic trading firm who does over $250 billion in daily volume trading and transfers nearly 650 petabytes of data, has open sourced their file system under the GPL version 2 and Apache 2.0 licenses. That means that this file system can be used in both open source and enterprise projects. And you might be asking yourself, why another file system? Well, to break this down, the goal here of TurnFS seems to be for it to be built for large mutable files, which means they will never be modified once they're created. It can scale to 10 exabytes, 1 trillion files, 100 billion directories, or 1 million clients. It also has geospanning, redundant, no single metadata bottlenecks, and it's great for running machine learning pipelines reliably. This is a major release. Most big Linux file systems like ZFS, ButterFS, and BcacheFS were started 10 to 20 years ago, a fresh file system designed in the 2020s with modern scale assumptions for, for AI and machine learning means it can deal with trillions of objects and exabytes of data. This is very rare and a very interesting move by XTX. Finance firms traditionally keep their infrastructure proprietary, and open sourcing this turn file system shows a shift. Even a data-heavy proprietary software industries are seeing value in contributing back to open source in order to get their systems developed quicker. You can now check out this project under the XTX Markets TurnFS repository, where you can read more about it and its goals. The target use case for TurnFS is the kind of machine learning we do at XTX, reading and writing large immutable files. By immutable, we mean that we do not need modifying after being created. Most of the storage will be taken up by files larger than a few megabytes. We don't expect directories to be created often or in files or directories to be moved between directories often. We also get a list of components and a breakdown of all the components that are a part of turn file system. It'll be interesting to follow this along. We'll be doing so, but let's move on to the next thing. In an email from Patrick Steinhardt, we get interesting news that says introduce Rust and announce that it will become mandatory for Git. But this says here, hi, this small patch of series introduces Rust into the core of Git. This patch series is designed as a test balloon similar to how we introduced test balloons for C99 features in the past. The goal is threefold. Give us some time to experiment with Rust and introduce proper build infrastructure. Give distributors time to ease into the new toolchain requirements. Introducing Rust is impossible for some platforms and hard for others. Announce that Git 3.0 will make Rust a mandatory part of our build infrastructure, which is big news as the Git project is overwhelmingly C code, millions of lines. And no, this does not mean that Git is being rewritten in Rust. What's changing here is starting with Git 3.0, there's an announcement here for the Git build system to require Rust, meaning require a Rust toolchain because some parts of Git will only exist in Rust. How do things work here? Today, Git version 2 is written entirely in C, but it does have optional experiments with Rust like variant.rs, but you can build Git completely without having a Rust toolchain. With this transition phase, Git developers are experimenting by moving tiny self-contained pieces of C to Rust. Like the example I already mentioned, Git 3.0 in the future will have at least one subsystem that will exist only in Rust, and that will mean that the build system will have to have Rust present. It's an interesting move by Git, as Git is considered critical infrastructure. Every developer company and Linux distribution really depends on Git, and any change in it affects millions of people. And of course, this can spark some controversy, as adding extra toolchain requirements is going to raise low concerns, portability issues, and of course, the C versus Rust divide. As everything seems to be rewritten in Rust these days, we'll see if this causes any fragmentation in the project but it'll be interesting to follow along with. Speaking about tool chains and linkers, we have a new Rust written linker called Wild that has been released by David Lattimore under the David Lattimore Wild repo. The goal here is to be faster than existing linkers like LLD, GNU LD, and even Mold. This linker also eventually will support incremental linking, something that Mold doesn't do or won't pursue. 
And for those of you who are unaware, incremental linking just means instead of relinking the entire program every single time you go to link, the linker only redoes the parts that have changed, making it much faster for the linking process when you're building projects. What's cool about this project is early benchmarks now show that Wild is faster than LLD and even in some cases faster than Mold. It's a pretty cool idea and it's great for people using Rust because notoriously Rust has a long build process and Wild's developers hope to manage the complexity of incremental linking more safely with better performance than C and C++. This helps with Rust's adoption in low-level tooling and is a big deal for tech and Linux. And under the Q&A, we ask why another linker. Mold is already very fast, however, it doesn't do incremental linking, and the author has stated that they don't intend to. Wild doesn't do incremental linking yet, but that is the end goal by writing Wild and Rust. It's hoped that the complexity of incremental linking will be achieved. Anyways, this is exciting news for not only Rust programs, but also C and C++ programs. Wild can also be dropped in as a linker for GCC or Clang using Fuse techniques and other compiled languages such as Zig, Go, Fortran, and Swift. Currently supported is Linux x86-64 architecture, ARM64, and RISC-V. Currently working with popular Rust crates and C and C++ projects, tested with Clang builds, Rust-C, etc. So just because it's written in Rust doesn't mean it only works on Rust. It will help with other compiled languages as well. We'll keep an eye on this one, but if you're enjoying the news, make sure to subscribe below. You wouldn't want to miss another segment like this and smash that like button on the way back up. And as a lot of people seem to always be talking about Rust, especially with the core utilities after some Linux distributions have made the choice to go with the Rust-based core utilities like Ubuntu here, starting in Ubuntu 25.10. Well, we have some updates for the C-based core utilities, 9.8 has been released and stable now. And in this stable release, we do have a few new major features, which include SHA-3 hashing with check sum A SHA-3. MProc now honors Linux group version 2 configured CPU quotas. Fold is now multi-byte character aware. Base58 encoding with base NC, base58. STTY can now set arbitrary baud rates on supported systems. Also, there have been a few bug fixes and other changes as summarized in the news below. And this time we had 348 commits by eight people in 24 weeks. Fantastic news as it doesn't get covered quite as much as the Rust core utilities nowadays, but there's clearly polish happening on modern Linux systems with the core utilities. They've been massively stable and working for many decades now. And it's exciting to see some new work as things like end process here finally report CPU based on C group version two limits, preventing jobs from over paralyzing and thrashing in Kubernetes, Docker, etc. I just wanted to switch it up a little bit as we seem to be talking about Rust quite a bit in Linux and tech. And speaking about Linux, there's been a new push to make a multi-kernel architecture inspired by research like Popcorn Linux, multi-kernel technologies founded by Kong Wang here has open source their Linux multi-kernel implementation. Code is now on GitHub and patches are being sent to the Linux kernel mailing list. The goal here is to advance operating system architecture for cloud computing, encourage collaboration, and create a new kernel design. We're excited to announce the multi-kernel is officially open sourcing our Linux kernel implementation. Our initial patches are now available on GitHub and submitted for review on LKML. Now, some of you might be asking, what is a multi-kernel? It is an operating system architecture where instead of one kernel running processes across CPU cores, you can run multi-independent kernels, one per core, socket, or even machine that cooperate with each other or talk to each other. You really have three different types of kernels here. A monolithic kernel, one big kernel managing everything. Then you have a microkernel, a tiny kernel with services, including drivers, file systems, etc., running in user space. And finally, this multi-kernel approach with lots of kernels, each managing its own hardware slice, communicating like a distributed system. You could think of a use case for this, like, for example, if you wanted to run a real-time Linux kernel and a regular kernel on two separate cores, this would be a great scenario for a multi-kernel. Which is interesting as ByteDance has also announced a different approach to doing really the same thing. Parker is a new proposed feature in Linux for multiple Linux kernels to run simultaneously on a single machine without traditional KVM virtualization. This is achieved by partitioning the CPU cores, memory, and devices for partitioning aware Linux kernel. We're seeing a massive shift here in two different companies announcing a multi-kernel approach. This is ByteDance versus multi-kernel technologies, and the philosophies are a little different. At the base here, the model requires multi-kernel technologies to use a cooperative multi-kernel, meaning kernels talk to each other with a distributed design. But Parker, which has been submitted by ByteDance, 
for those of you unaware, ByteDance is the creator and owner of TikTok. Well, they want a partitioned kernel approach. This means kernels are isolated and there's no communication between each other, meaning they can only focus on their own subtasks. And why do both approaches matter here? Together, they showed a renewed interest in multi-kernel Linux approaches after decades of SMP monolithic dominance. So it's very interesting to see both of these companies coming through and trying to evolve how distributed operating systems are managed at a hardware level. We'll see how all this plays out, and I'm definitely excited to try this for myself. I do like running real-time systems, especially hard real-time for, for control algorithms, and it'll be very interesting to see if I can finally get Linux to work properly in that sense with this multi-kernel level approach. And if you want to learn more about Linux, check out my checklist, cheat sheet, and mind map, all available at SavvyNick.com. Download them today. And now let's talk about a little bit of drama. As BcacheFS is now available as a DKMS package on an official app repository for BcacheFS tools. This gives users up-to-date and official packaging for BcacheFS outside of their distro repository. And it's important for users, you can now get up-to-date BcacheFS without having to wait on the distro. This is because BcacheFS got set to externally maintained in the mainline kernel, which has caused it to scramble and find a way to get BcacheFS back to its users before we get another kernel release. So now you can get it back on Ubuntu and Debian by adding a user managed repository and then running sudo apt update and install bcachefs tools. This is a big deal for Ken Overstreet as he originally created bcachefs and recently had announced that bcachefs would ship as a DKMS module. And Ubuntu being one of the biggest Linux distributions, it makes sense for users to have a dynamic kernel module support package available on Ubuntu and Debian. Mainly, this helps distributions as they're off the hook for maintaining entry support. They can now ship a DKMS package instead, and users can install it themselves as well. As bcachefs was struggling with the mainline Linux kernel, it now has pivoted to a DKMS module and external tooling model, basically taking what ZFS did and evolving outside the kernel tree, and we'll see what happens in the coming weeks and years. Will bcachefs get back into the Linux kernel? mainline at some point. It's possible, just not right now. I want to know your thoughts on all the news. A lot covered today, and it seems like Rust keeps getting introduced more and more into tech nowadays. We'll see how things pan out. We'll follow along. Don't forget to subscribe below and smash that like button on the way back up. Catch me in a great community on Discord, and I'll catch you in another video. Thanks for watching.